Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. Okay. So as I said, my name is Tanya Roy. I'm an assistant professor at the Nanoscience Technology Center with my tenure home in material science and engineering. I joined UCF in 2016. Before that, I was a postdoc at University of California, Berkeley and at Georgia Tech. And I did my PhD in electrical engineering from Vanderbilt University. At UCF, I'm teaching uh, the undergraduate course Structure and Properties of Materials, typically for, uh, taken by MAE and MSE undergrads. I have taught semiconductor devices one in one semester. Uh, I teach a course for nanoscience along with four other faculty members. It's called Properties of Materials at the Nanoscale. And the graduate course that I teach for MSE is Surface Science. It is about the characterization techniques that we use at MCF. Uh, my research is in semiconductor device physics. So that's my research background. At UCF, I am focusing on something called neuromorphic computing, and I'm going to talk more about that for the rest of the talk. My focus has always been to make low power electronic devices because we want to make our devices energy efficient. I do a little bit of reliability physics and I dabble in solar cells. There, the focus is to make very thin solar cells and the associated problems with that have to be adjusted with photon management schemes. I use two dimensional materials as the platform to make all these devices, but my loyalty actually is more towards semiconductor device physics. So whatever I make can be translated to other material systems as well. I got the NSF Career Award in 2019 and I've uh, been funded by BAE Systems, uh, UCF Research Foundation, among other uh, grants and currently working with AFRL on certain projects. Now the motivation behind neuromorphic computing. Uh, but, but before even I go on to this slide, I'm sure you all have faced this problem if you have those Alexa devices or Google Home devices at home. Whenever there is no internet connectivity, you uh, shout your command out to those devices and uh, they simply turn, go around in those red circles. They are not able to understand what you're saying. That the reason being, actually Alexa does not house any of the artificial intelligence circuitry. It's all located in the cloud. So you have to always have internet connectivity to connect to the cloud, uh, those, those remote servers, which look like steel plants, which have huge bulky circuits doing those simple jobs that you ask the, your device to do. Similarly, if you have an autonomous vehicle, an unmanned aerial vehicle, it does not have the capacity to house any of the pattern recognition circuitry. So it has the camera, which takes beautiful images, sends to the cloud through the internet, and then all the activity is done there in the cloud. It, it gets the uh, final information and does whatever task it has been uh, assigned to it. Or if the vehicle is large enough, then it can house the high-end graphics processing units. But just because the way things are done today, these are huge, these are high power, they, are, they act to the weight of the vehicle. So what we are suggesting is we'll bypass this cloud-based learning as well as this uh, graphics processing unit to some extent. We'll make a new kind of hardware which can allow in situ pattern recognition. Your device can do the pattern recognition in remote areas without having to connect to the internet. So that's our goal. And how will we do that? It is through this neuromorphic computation. So our brains are very good at pattern recognition. That's because they are made up of these neurons and synapses. And using that software has been there. The neural network, soft, uh, software based neural network has been there since the 1960s. And that tremendous progress has been made on that. But that software runs on conventional CMOS based hardware and CMOS was never meant to behave like neurons and synapses in the brain. So what eventually happens is look at this one synapse being uh, realized with so many transistors. If you want to build a complex uh, pattern recognition circuitry, you end up making it huge. It's also very power hungry. So what is the alternative? If we can make devices which behaves like neuron and synapses, a single uh, nanoscale device which behaves like a synapse or a single uh, uh, nanoscale device which behaves like the neur neuron, a lot of the problem will be solved. And that's what uh, device physicists today are working on. So the synapses, they perform the very, very complex task of vector matri matrix multiplication on hardware. So that uh, function, that task, which is of a high complexity, can be reduced to a very uh, simple level just because it is being done on hardware by something called crossbar array of synapses. So we are making these artificial synapses with the two-dimensional materials. 
there are many reasons for doing that. One is, of course, the ease with which we can make using two dimensional materials and also the flexibility of the because of the mechanical properties of these materials. They are lightweight. But what we also see is that these devices have some advantages over conventional emerging synaptic devices. So contradictory statements, conventional emerging, but uh, yeah, usually others use, say, phase change memory or oxide based memory to do these synaptic devices. But those devices are very uh, require high programming current. And we've seen that with using our two dimensional materials, we can reduce the programming current. So energy efficient is uh, one thing. The other thing is that they show extremely high linearity and symmetry in their characteristics. And those who are in this field will know how important that is for synaptic behavior. We saw that if you use the basic characteristics of our synapses and simulate their performance, they can give higher accuracy than any other emerging synaptic devices uh, today being studied. So this work is funded by my NSF Career Award and by VA Systems. And the materials we get is from our collaborator, Professor Yang Mung Jung at NSTC and NSC. The other thing we are trying to build, another component of this neuromorphic system is the artificial neuron. They behave like the human neuron. This uh, shows spikes in time if you apply a stimulus to them. And we have made them with our molysulfide based systems because I'm a device physicist. I take the same material systems. I engineer the structure in sense in terms of thickness, in terms of the electrodes that you can use in terms of the layout. And I try to get the device properties out. So we are able to get neuronal behavior as well from the sim from similar material stack. These uh, neurons are an important part of the, neuro of, of the neural uh, network. Uh, that's there. But another factor we are why are using these two dimensional materials is for monolithic integration. So conventionally, what people try to do is, okay, synapses can be made with a different material systems, neuron can be with a different CMOS-based systems or something else. But the problem of heterogeneous integration, even though heterogeneous integration is very interesting, is it's extremely expensive. And also in terms of material properties, there, is, uh, there are issues of material compatibility, substrate compatibility, temperature requirements for growth. So monolithic integration is the way to go. And that's actually what I proposed for the NSF Career Award as well. So we are trying to make the well, uh, make the synapses and the neurons with the same material system so that we can have larger uh, large scale neural networks realized. Another factor I want to mention about is the switching in these devices is stochastic in time, but of course with a deterministic trend, otherwise what's the use? So I'm seeking for collaboration from people who are doing prob probabilistic computation so that we can discuss on how we may be able to help you with these kind of device characteristics. Now, another step is optoelectronic synapse. So what I talked about two slides back is electronic synapses. Optoelectronic synapses actually make the neural network system even smaller, the pattern recognition system even more compact. Because here, whatever is being used to image is being used in the pattern recognition system. So typically what happens is a camera has pixels, the, that information, a lot of image processing has to happen. Then essential information is extracted and fed to the neural network. But here with the optoelectronic synapse, the pixel itself is doing, also has additional memory. So just like the human eye, we can understand what we are seeing. These devices also can understand or remember what they can see. And that's why they, are, uh, they take part in the neural network hardware as well. Makes it a lot more compact. We have published a work with Professor Jan Thomas in Science Advances. It got uh, a lot of coverage. Uh, and uh, our goal is now to move towards other wavelengths move towards other uh, material systems to see how the, the material can be more responsive, etc. Okay, now I'll digress a little bit into the other topic that I work on a little bit, that's solar cells. Now here the goal is, uh, I try to make the solar cells as thin as possible so that they are of course flexible, bendable, uh, so that they can be used in IoT devices to uh, power those devices. But also the benefit of uh, reducing the thickness of solar cells is of course you can reduce material consumption. But the disadvantage is that as you reduce the substrate thickness, the absorption capacity of that substrate has also reduced. So the efficiency of the solar cell will reduce drastically. What can be done to circumvent that problem? People engineer light trapping structures, advanced photon management schemes. And uh, this idea was given to me by my ex postdoc. What can do it best? The leaf. Leaf has evolved for over so many years to have the perfect light trapping structure. So the cells of the leaves we emulate using nanoparticles, all dielectric nanoparticles, where a certain kind of cells, they're called the palisade mesophyll cells, are emulated by nanoparticles, which can focus and funnel the light. And the spongy mesophyll cells scatter the light. So we do that with another uh, dielectric constant uh, nanoparticle. 
So this whole scheme works very well. It can in, uh, increase the efficiency of solar cells, silicon-based solar cells by about 33%. Uh, I mean, higher, it increases by 33%. Um, we have published a paper on this and we also have a patent published so far uh, on this work. And now our goal is to use these kind of structures on other substrates, non-silicon substrates and see how they work. And these, are, these uh, structures are not just going to be used for solar cells. They are good for any device which wants to absorb more light. It could be used for photo detectors to enhance their absorption capabilities. Uh, my near-term goals, I want to make the complete pattern recognition hardware with the molysulfide-based synapse neuron systems and the optoelectronic synapses. So this is the pattern recognition we want to do it on hardware. Uh, we want to use, the, as I said, the light trapping structures of, uh, on other uh, kinds of devices, solar cells or otherwise. And I, to, under, to make these devices much more reliable is one goal. And I want to, of course, continue to enhance the name of NSTC and MSC in international conferences and let them know what good work we are doing here. Long-term goals. So we, are, uh, we want to do it on hardware. That's good. But in the long run, we want to be of use to human beings in different ways. So just like uh, Elon Musk is doing the Neuralink uh, uh, the work, we want to use this pattern recognition hardware also uh, integrate it with the human brain someday uh, so that uh, we can help people with neurogenerative disorders or other functionalities that they have lost. Uh, the other aspect would be to move towards making products which can help in in-home diagnostics for elderly people or even for astronauts because our devices, we are saying we don't need internet connectivity. They will do the pattern recognition in situ. So if we can use them for people who, are, who do not have internet connectivity all the time, like astronauts in space or uh, by people who are located in remote areas, that will be good. And eventually someday I hope to venture into other uh, areas which I have not tried, like quantum computed, computing and terahertz computation and all those. Uh, this is my team. Right now I have four graduate students and a couple of undergraduate students whose pictures are not there here. I had uh, most of this work was done by these graduate students and the postdocs that I had, the postdocs have moved towards more greener territories today and a lot of undergrads in the group. I thank you all for your attention and welcome questions. Um, thanks.